And the Bible says that when you see the increase of wickedness, and when you see the gospel being preached around the world, a testimony to all nations and to all people, that the end is near. Hey, it's Pastor Dudley of Lift Up Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us today on our broadcast. I'm going to be sharing some history lessons. I don't know about you, but I enjoy history. And if we fail to remember, then we're doomed to repeat it oftentimes. We wanna learn the good and the bad, but then we wanna go to the scriptures. And we wanna see what God's word and God's will for us today as we move towards the future. And so I hope today you've got your Bible, hope you've got some notes, hope you'll invite some friends and join us today on our broadcast. But thank you for listening and for being here. I'm excited to preach for you this new series called The Sands of Time. Today is our fifth message in the series, The Sands of Time. But it was Winston Churchill who is most often quoted from a 1948 speech to the House of Commons when he said these words, those who fail to learn from history are condemned uh, to repeat it. And it's why we've done this series. And so we're looking at history, learning both the good and the bad, so that we don't make the same mistakes. And as we move forward to the next decade and beyond, with the goal of being wiser and the goal of being godlier. Our history lesson today is the story of Pearl Harbor. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter five. It's a hard book to find, but you can do it. 1 Thessalonians chapter five. Pearl Harbor is a United States Naval base in Honolulu, Hawaii. It is 2,000 miles from the United States mainland, and it's 4,000 miles from Japan. On December the 7th, 1941, just before 8 o'clock a.m., Sunday morning, there were hundreds of Japanese fighter planes that descended on the base that housed 20 American naval vessels eight battleships, most of them were on what's called Battleship Row, and some 300 United States airplanes were there. And uh, there were a number of events that led up to this point. The Japanese believed that if they could destroy our Pacific fleet, that somehow it would enable them to take control over the South Pacific. So on a Sunday morning, while most people were sleeping or just waking up, getting ready for church, Japanese planes rained down bullets and bombs within the harbor and battleship row. At 8.10 a.m., an 1,800-pound bomb smashed through the deck of the USS Arizona and landed in her forward ammunition department, and the ship literally exploded and sank with more than 1,000 men trapped inside. Next, torpedoes pierced the shell of the battleship USS Oklahoma that had 400 sailors aboard. And in two hours, the surprise attack was over. Every battleship had sustained significant damage or been destroyed and more than 2,400 Americans died in that attack with another 1,000 wounded. The next day, President Franklin D. Roosevelt asked Congress to declare war on Japan and declared that that day, December 7, 1941, would be a day which would live in infamy. On December 8th, the next day, Congress approved Roosevelt's uh, declaration of war on Japan, and within three days, 
Japan's allies, Germany and Italy, declared war against the United States. Japan bombed the United States and British bases in the Philippines, in Guam, in Midway Island, in Hong Kong, and for the second time, Congress reciprocated and declared war on the European powers. More than two years after the start of World War II, the United States was finally entered into that global conflict. Now, if you ever have a chance to visit Honolulu, it's a beautiful place. I hope you'll take the time to tour uh, Pearl Harbor. I, I would encourage you to take that tour. I personally have done so several years ago uh, to take the tour and to visit Pearl Harbor. It is a very, very sobering story to learn the details and to realize uh, the death and devastation that took place. And eventually, the United States dropped the atomic bomb on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and thus ending Japan's aggression in the world. And even though I wish that everything that I had just explained uh, to you, I wish that none of it had ever happened, I am thankful that today that our two nations, the United States and Japan, are at peace and that we're actually allies together in, in the world arena. Now, when visiting Pearl Harbor, if you ever go to Honolulu, if you ever take that tour, you end up in a souvenir shop. And when you walk through the souvenir shop, uh, there's, there are bookshelves that are littered with, with books. There's a countless number of books that tell the story of what happened at Pearl Harbor. And when I was there, I asked the, the tour guide who was hosting us, I asked the tour guide, of all these books, which book, if I only buy one, which book is the best book that truly tells me what took place here many years ago? He quickly handed me this book right here. It's a book entitled, At Dawn We Slept. At Dawn We Slept. It's a big book. But if you read this book, you come away learning that Pearl Harbor was indeed a surprise attack. Japan maintained radio silence for the 3,500 mile track with their carriers. And when they launched their planes off those carriers several hundred miles from Oahu at six o'clock a.m., the Japanese spotted uh, land around 7.30 a.m. And when their bombs were released, uh, there was a captain, Mitsuo Fuchida, broke radio silence and said the words, Torah, 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 which means tiger, 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 which was a coded message informing the Japanese fleet that they had caught the Americans by surprise. We also know that there was an American officer who had heard of a report but discounted it from an Oahu radio or radar operator that had found there was a large number of planes were headed their direction, but he didn't do anything about it. The U.S. radar picked up uh, they thought, they believed over 50 airplanes that were approaching uh, Honolulu from the north, but they failed to take reasonable precautions because they were convinced that Pearl Harbor was safe. And so the bombs fell. And the United States, we were sleeping literally and figuratively. And with that story as the background, I want to talk to you today about surprises. I want you to just everybody say the word surprise. Come on, say it one more time. Everybody say surprise, surprise. Whenever I read my Bible, there are many things in there that are surprising, many things. For example, in Genesis chapter 21, when Abraham and Sarah had a baby and Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, that is very, very surprising to me. I, I think it's surprising to you. In Numbers chapter 22, uh, there's a donkey 
that starts to talk. That's in Numbers chapter 22. That is very surprising to hear a donkey talking. Joshua chapter 10 is the story of where the sun stood still. That's extremely surprising. And in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, the Bible mentions that the earth was round thousands of years before anyone recognized that that is a true fact. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 27, I'm surprised when I hear and read that a man named Methuselah, which is the oldest man that we have record who ever lived, the Bible says he lived to be 969 years of age. That, that, that hurts my back just thinking about how old that is. We don't know how he died. Some people think he was blowing out the candles and started hyperventilating. We don't, we don't know. But these are just a few of the things, of, of the many things that I find surprising in the Word of God. I want to give you four things, a list of four things if you're taking notes, four more things that surprise me, and I want you as I go through this list to see if they surprise you as well, okay? Are you with me? Number one, the first thing I'm surprised by is the fact that God came into this world in the form of a baby. That's a little surprising to everyone, I, I think. Of course, Israel is looking for a promised Messiah, one who will deliver them from Rome's occupation. He, the Messiah, when he comes, he is supposed to be the ruler of all rulers. Israel is looking for a king. They're looking for a deliverer. And surprise, here is a cute little chubby face baby, a crying, diaper-messing newborn a tiny, fragile infant. And I think when I hear that, I go, God, are you serious? You're gonna come into the earth in the form of a baby? Are you, are you kidding me? So that's surprise number one. Surprise number two, I'm surprised who God chose to start the New Testament church. The New Testament church, when it was started, it was started by a group of disciples. They really were a group of misfits. You can read all about how the church began in the book of Acts, specifically in Acts chapter 2, and you'll discover that when God began his kingdom here on earth, that he, it was led by a group of fishermen, some, some Galileans. These were folks that were uneducated uh, for their day and for ours. They were, if you will, a bunch of country bumpkins. There was a foul-mouthed fisherman by the name of Peter. There was a hot-tempered man by the name of John, and there was a dishonest, greedy, snake-like guy named Judas. And these are the ones that Jesus handed the keys of the kingdom to and said, fellas, I'm going to put you in charge of the New Testament church and expanding the kingdom of God around the world. I said, God, are you serious? Is this like an April Fool's joke? I'm surprised whom God chose to begin the New Testament church. Number three, hope you're writing this down. I am surprised by the unbelievable fact that God loves me, that God loves sinners, and that he, God, this is surprising to me. I mean, I can't believe it, that, that God was willing, not just willing that he did, he was willing to give up his one and only son for people like you and for people like me. How many times have you felt God? How many times have we felt God? How many times have we fallen? How many times have we sinned? How many times have we done just the opposite of what God wants us to do? And yet God loves me anyway. God loves you anyways. I, I don't know. I don't know if we will ever be able to fully understand how much God loves us. And all I'm saying is this, I am surprised, I'm just surprised that God would allow Jesus, his one and only son, to suffer to the degree of which he suffered for the likes of you and me. Oh, it really is, it is amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I see was blind, but now I see. I'm saying, Jesus, that God surprised us 
by coming into the world as an infant. I'm saying that he surprised us by choosing the lowly fisherman. I'm saying I'm surprised the fact that he loves us so to such degree. But number four, one day, everybody say one day, say one day one more time, one day, write this down, one day we're all going to be surprised at the return of Jesus Christ. Just like they were caught off guard on the morning of December 7th, 1941 at Pearl Harbor, so too you and I and the entire world, we will all one day be surprised when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. I want to read this to you. I'll put the verses on the screen, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I, I want to read a couple of these verses. It says, For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, the Bible says destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. And verse 4 says, but you brothers are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. It shouldn't surprise you. John Piper, many of you know him, he's written a, a, a new book, one of his recent books, and you know what it's called? It's called The Coronavirus and Christ. That's the name of the book. And he writes in that book that through this coronavirus, that Jesus is saying to us that this world, this world that you are living in, will not last forever. You need to think about that world that in the coming days, in the future, that one day we're going to be passing from this life into the next and we need to be prepared for that day. And he says we need to wake up. Now we don't know what day the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. I wanna say that to you again. We do not know the date when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. Nobody knows. But if you study your Bible, and I'll put the references, if you study Matthew chapter 24, and you'll study 2 Timothy chapter 3, those two uh, references will give you what's called the signs of the time. Now, you don't need a Bible college degree. You don't need a preacher to explain it to you. All you have to do is open up your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you can Google those passages. And just read Matthew chapter 24, and read 2 Timothy chapter 3, and there's a list there of signs that when you see these things happening, you know that it's the season, it's the time, even though we don't know the exact date, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return, and he's going to return soon. Now, I think sooner and I, I am a Sooner. I'm an Oklahoma Sooner. I've always been a Sooner. I'm an Oklahoma Sooner. I'm, I'm not only an Oklahoma Sooner, I'm a Jesus is coming back Sooner type of a person. Because when I read my Bible, and again, I don't need a professor. I don't need a Bible college degree to understand. If I just open up my Bible and I read Matthew chapter 24, and I read 2 Timothy chapter 3, the return of Christ and returning soon is undeniable. One of the most, of all the signs uh, that, I, that speak to me are the ones in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12 and verse 14. Verse 12 says, because of the increase of wickedness. And what that means is that when you look around at the world and you see that there's an increase of wickedness, that's one of the signs. What I think is the increase of wickedness. And right now, in our state, because of the virus, and because of those who are in charge, you can go to a liquor store, you can go to a marijuana shop, you can go get an abortion, uh, you can go down to Home Depot, it's wall-to-wall it's -wall people, the parking, there's no place to park, there's so many people. Go to Walmart, wall-to-wall -wall people. They, this week, they opened up the casinos. You can now go to the casinos, it's okay. If you wanna to go to the casino, go to the casino, but they've shut down the churches. To me, that's an increase of wickedness. To, to me, it does, it's not, maybe not to you. But as you just look around at all the people 
that live here and the sinful lives that we live. And, and if you watch television or you look at any movie, we're living in that day and age where there's an increase of wickedness. And when you see that, you know that the end is near. The next verse here in verse 14 says, and when you see the gospel, the gospel, that's, that's when you hear the gospel message of, of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, when you see that the gospel of the kingdom is being preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, when you see the gospel being preached around the world, you'll know that the end is about here. And what I think, and this is just me, you know, the internet, because of the internet, you know, 40 years ago, there was no internet. 50 years ago, there was no internet. The only way the gospel could get around the world is if you walked, if you traveled, took a boat, took a plane. But now because of the internet, what I'm saying right now is being transmitted all around the world. Now I want you to think about something. Uh, several months ago, before the churches were shut down, there were some churches that were online, but not all churches. Now, we are here at Shepherd because we, we believe in using that technology to the glory of God. Can someone say amen? But today, because of the coronavirus and because every church has been shut, churches and synagogues all around the world, this is not just in the United States, this is in the entire world, churches and pastors have been forced to put our messages online and on the internet. And so because of that, again, what, what the devil causes for harm, God can turn it into the good. There are more sermons being preached on the internet and around the entire globe because of the coronavirus than ever before. There are more people hearing the gospel than in any other period in the history of the world. And the Bible says that when you see the increase of wickedness, and when you see the gospel being preached around the world, a testimony to all nations and to all people, that the end is near. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want you to know uh, that the question is, are you ready? That, that, that's the question, is are you ready? And if you're not ready, if you're not ready, you need to wake up. I mean, I mean wake up spiritually and, and be prepared for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, J.D. Greer recently wrote these words. He said, I don't think that the coronavirus marks the end of the world, but this world does have an end. And if we ignore that reality, then we are asleep at the will. The coronavirus, as disastrous as it is, it represents God's merciful wake-up call for you and I to get ready. Oh, get ready, get ready, get ready. The Bible says again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4, we looked at this verse once, look at it again. But you brothers, everybody say brothers, brothers. That means those of us that are believers, those of us that are Christians, those of us that are, are children of God, we are not in darkness. So that this day, the day of the Lord's return, should surprise us like a thief. In other words, if we're saved, if we're believers, if we're Christians, the return of Jesus Christ should not surprise us. Because as believers, we've read the scriptures. We've looked at the signs. We understand those signs and we believe that the the return of Jesus Christ is near. I want to show you this verse over here in Matthew chapter 24. This is that same chapter, but a little bit later on it says, therefore, everybody say therefore, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. We don't know the day. We can know the season, but we don't know the day. But understand this, that if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night that the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and he would not, everybody say not, he would not have let his house 
be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Oh, I hope you were blessed today. I don't know about you, but there's something about history that we learn as we move towards the future. And one thing I know is that God's word is eternal. I wanna thank you for tuning in today. I pray if you were blessed by today's message that you will contact us. You can just call the number on the screen. We would love to have you come along and partner with us so that we can continue this broadcast and broadcast all around the world. I know that you know this, but we think that we have the best name of any program on television, Lift Up Jesus, and that's why we exist, to simply lift up the name and the person of Jesus. We wanna encourage you to join us prayerfully, financially, verbally, however you can to support us so that we can reach the four corners of this globe. I wanna thank you, please know that I love you. We are praying for you. Feel free to write to us and let us know if you've been blessed by this message today. And I want you to know that whatever you're doing or wherever you're going, don't forget to always lift up Jesus. Hey, it's Pastor Dudley, and I wanna thank you so much for tuning in today. You know that I love to preach, I love the Word of God, and I love lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. And this program, it's called Lift Up Jesus. And that's why we exist, to lift up Jesus, because we know He will draw all people unto Himself. We need people like you, who watch week after week, who give, offer financial support, who pray for us, that makes all of this possible. I just wanna encourage you to call us on the number on the screen or go to our website. We would appreciate any gift, any amount of support you could give us. And remember that we'll take every dollar and use that to lift up Jesus that the world might believe. God bless each and every one of you. And remember, whatever you're doing, don't forget to always lift up Jesus. Research proves that it's the regular hearing and teaching of the Word of God that takes our Christian life to a new level. That's why we invite you to meet Dudley Rutherford every week on this station for another powerful message straight from the Bible. You can also visit liftupjesus.com to sign up for our monthly email devotional, discover Pastor Dudley's books and other resources, and see our national TV and radio schedule. And don't hesitate to reach out on the phone or online. Pastor Dudley has a passion and vision to reach more people with a message of hope. And if you'd like to partner with us to touch the world, we'd love to hear from you. Your financial gift will do so much to help us impact the nations for Christ. And if you're ever in the Southern California area, we invite you to visit us at Shepherd Church here in Los Angeles. It's an amazing experience you'll never forget. Until next time, remember to always lift up Jesus. Jesus.